action on responsible ways of doing business in a high growth environment. It is my pleasure to present to you Mr. Habibullah N. Karim, member of MCCI committee and former president of BASIS as the honorable chair for this session. We are very delighted to have Dr. Asan Mansoor, executive director of Policy Research Institute as the keynote speaker in this session. Our panelists for this session are Mr. Rubayat Jamil, Managing Director, ICE Technologies, Dr. Muhammad Abu Yusuf, Professor, Develop Department of Development Studies, University of Dhaka, Dr. Munzur Hussain, Senior Research Fellow, Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, Mr. Khandakar Mainuddin, Senior Fellow, Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, and Dr. Farazi Binti Firdos, Research Fellow of SANIM. One of our distinguished panelists, Mr. Tabith M. Awal, member of MCCI, uh, will join us, uh, will hopefully join us later. I would now like to request Dr. Selim Raihan, Executive Director of SANEM and Professor of Department of Economics, University of Dhaka, to speak a few words before us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Welcome back after lunch. I know this is uh, the most difficult time, uh, but I'm quite sure the panelists, uh, they will keep us awake. And the audience, too, uh, with questions and answers, uh, and I think you know, this session will be a very live one. I must thank Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce Industries uh, to collaborate with SANEM to have this session. And this is so topical that we are having this session, the topic uh, the responsible ways of doing business in a high growth environment. And Bangladesh is you know, having a kind of high growth phase over the last one decade or so, and looking forward to have a higher growth phase, 8% or more. And in that context, how the private sector will, uh, what act, the, what responsibilities will be the private sector have? I think this is something very important we need to understand. Especially with regard to, I think we have SDGs target by 2030. We have targets of becoming a middle income country and gradually moving towards upper middle income country. Probably those are, there are so many challenges at home. Uh, what I see that the role of our private sector or responsible business is not simply CSR. It's not simply corporate social responsibility. It is something much more beyond that. It is something like how do you ensure uh, decent job, how do you really make uh, sure that uh, that business process becomes more inclusive? And in that context, because the whole theme of the conference is making growth uh, in social inclusive, uh, managing uh, uh, growth so for social inclusion, in that context, what would be the role of the private sector? I'm really glad that MCC, as I said, uh, is collaborating with us. And I'm also really grateful to Dr. Asan Mansur uh, for agreeing to uh, deliver the keynote speech. So with this, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to request you to contact the session. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Selim Rahan. Uh, of course, uh, it's our pleasure on behalf of the Metropolitan Chamber and Commerce and Industry uh, to be uh, co-organizing this particular session. Uh, of course, uh, I'm basically uh, chairing this session on behalf of the Metropolitan Chamber President uh, who couldn't be with us today. Uh, so, you know, I will go right to our keynote speaker, who I consider my guru in the economic field, uh, Dr. Hassan Mansoor. And, uh, uh, and then, based on uh, his keynote, then we'll have the designated discussants, all of whom I'm sure will be able to uh, uh, throw uh, ample light on this. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm an engineer by, uh, uh, by education and uh, a uh, software businessman by trade. But of course, economics touches us all. And this noble idea of inclusive growth is something that uh, all of us uh, aspire to. So I'm really look for, uh, looking forward to the deliberations here. So without fu further ado, uh, may I request Dr. Asan Mansur to kindly deliver his keynote.
Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for for the introduction. And let me first uh, thank all the participants and the distinguished panelists for for gathering here for this particular uh, session. Uh, the session is very topical, topical in the sense that, uh, as Salim, Professor Salim Ryan rightly said, that Bangladesh is indeed going through a growth spurt. I mean, yes, and we hope it's a sustainable growth that we are experiencing. And to make it sustainable and in line with the expectations of the, of the government and of the people, of course, there are certain um, responsibilities, both on the part of the government as well as on the business community. And this is a partnership that needs to happen over time and get stronger because development of the country in the way, in a sustainable manner, in a, in a manner that will make the country livable as, a, as well as prosperous, is a, is a, is a balancing task and will require uh, contribution from all segments of the society. It's not only of the government and it is not only of the private sector. So in that sense, this is a, a very topical subject. And we have seen in many, many countries that one, first, the growth is not necessarily guaranteed that it will be sustained. I was coming from Washington, DC last week, I mean, this week, actually. I mean, and there, the I was a third pen, uh, country presentation, but the other two countries, one was growing at 0.5%, no, 0.2% for the last 10 years. So you can imagine, and their main task, the person who is responsible for enhancing growth and all that, he says my main task is to increase it in the next four years to 5% of GDP growth. So that, and he said that that's a 25 times increase in the last 10 years historical average. So that's a major challenge for, for some of those countries. So there is no country in the world who should take growth as guaranteed. There should not be any complacency on that. In my presentation, um, I will, I, I will first describe that Banglad how Bangladesh's economic performance has been and the structural transformation that has gone through, which will set the stage for the medium term and medium and long term industrialization and employment objectives that the government has set for itself and for the country. And what are the associated challenges? Of course, there are responsibilities on the part of the government, but that is not the discussion for today. Today's discussion is that how to make this growth environmentally sustainable. It's a primary responsibility lies with the polluters, which means the private sector. And how to make this growth also socially desirable through good business practices. That's also a responsibility of the private sector. Of course, government in all areas will and must play an oversight role and should be limited to that oversight, not doing business by itself. Along with that, I'll also focus briefly on the CSR-related activities, corporate social responsibility, which is a very rudimentary stage in Bangladesh, and that needs to grow, as well as socially responsible investment and leadership roles by the business community. So these are the topics that I will touch upon today. Um, overall economic performance, we all know that Bangladesh has made significant progress, no doubt, in terms of increasing growth and income, per capita, which is now 1460 plus dollar. When it started, we were less than $100 per capita income country. So that itself is, 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 is a progress unquestionably too. And in particular, in the last uh, decade or so, a per capita income has really increased threefold, and that's a remarkable. And in the last five years, during the six, five year plan, the GDP has grown twice, doubled in dollar terms. So that's also a remarkable performance. So that's a high growth scenario for Bangladesh, no, no question about it. We never experienced this kind of growth in the history of Bangladesh for a prolonged period. I mean, this is prolonged, why? Because from 2001 to 2015, this 15 year period, the average growth has been 6.3%. So that's a remarkably stable and, and respectable level of growth, unquestionably. Rural economy has also transformed during this period from a periodic, I mean, predominantly agricultural economy, which Bangladesh used to be, 
to a more non-farm economic structure. So we're dealing primarily, our economy is now a non-farm economy. Growth has been fueled by industrial sector uh, at its own, at the core of it. So that's also a positive thing because that matches with the historical evolution of most of the industrial countries that has gone through that different phases of growth. Modern services like banking, financial services, ICT, all has done well in this period. There has been also a noticeable increase in labor productivity in the last five years or six years. And this is reflected also in the real wage increase of all segments of workers, um, starting with the landless peasants, peasant farmers in, in the rural areas. So from there to industrial workers, everywhere the, the real wages have increased quite significantly in the last uh, half a decade. Now, how does Bangladesh compare and why we're saying that high growth scenario? So the rationale is from here. You can see that this is for the year 2012 to 2016 or 17 projected, how Bangladesh compares with other countries in our comparative set. In this comparative set, we only took the high growth countries of the world today, China, India, Vietnam, and Bangladesh, we're comparing with that. And you can see how Bangladesh compares very favorably among these very high performing countries. These are the best performers in the world today in terms of big economy as well as fastest growing economy in the world. And Bangladesh's performance is, is, is admirable in that regard. And that's what, that gives us the characterization that, that high growth environment is a reality now, at least for now. Whether it will be sustained, that's to be seen, but it's a, it's a high growth scenario that is, that is there on the ground today. It has happened during the sixth plan, and it is in the making also, uh, the first year of the seventh plan, which is now underway. <coughs> the other characteristic of Bangladesh's growth performance is that it is remarkably stable. During this period, the global economy has gone through many turmoils, starting with global economic crisis, then the European debt crisis, then, um, then several other mini crises in the sense, uh, in many ways. And, and Bangladesh's growth has been, you can see the line is very stable. Unlike India, for example. India started with higher growth, but then it tumbled, and then again it is high, high growth, higher than Bangladesh as of now. So, but Bangladesh is pretty much stable, and on average our performance is, you can say, the number two almost every year in this, in this group of countries, and that's, that's a good performance. So, Against that backdrop, the government has set itself a very ambitious national agenda. And this chart is basically trying to represent it here. Uh, the numbers are taken from the government's Delta Plan, which is a plan beyond the five year, seventh five year plan period, goes up to 2031. And it shows that the target is to take it to almost $5,000 per capita income by 2031 fiscal year. So that will require, number one, more than 8% growth on average for the whole period, particularly beyond the seven five-year plan period. And it is built on the fact that between 2005 and 2000. 15, per capita income in Bangladesh in dollar term has increased threefold. So essentially, it's, it's targeting to build on that momentum and looking forward. So this is an ambitious target, and, and this has ramifications for the economy, for the society, and for managing that process. And that's the topic that we will be discussing. So the performance that we have seen is basically driven by higher growth in manufacturing sector or industrial sector, you can call it in the broader terms. Um, agriculture has been stable and 
in all societies, all economies, agriculture cannot grow at double digit or very high single digit level. Normally, it grows at the rate of 2.5 to 3.5 max, maximum. And Bangladesh has been doing it in that range. So it's, it's a respectable level of performance by the agriculture sector. Satisfactory, no complaint about that. And it has been successful in being self-sufficient in food and also supplying a lot of other uh, agricultural outputs in vegetable, in fruits, in fisheries, in other um, uh, livestock and, and poultry and so on and so forth. So, so agriculture in general has been a, a very providing a good support to the economy, although it is not expected to drive the economic growth in future for, uh, to achieve the kind of targets that the government is trying to achieve. Just um, skipping that slide coming here, you can see how the agriculture growth has picked up from 1.8 during 81 to 99, the 20-year period more or less, to 3.4% in the next decade. And uh, the first decade was 1.8, second decade was 3.4, and the last five years is also 3.4. So agriculture has been very steady and respectable. Industrial growth, which is the bedrock for future growth, we can see how it is increasing, and that needs to be sustained. And that's the bottom line. Uh, it's from 5.6 to 7, 7 to 9.3. And within the industrial sector, it's the manufacturing, and the, particularly the large scale manufacturing, that has been the basis for our growth so far. So the two elements that I will underscore here is that SME sector has not done as good as it could have. Perhaps there is it's an opportunity that can be exploited to accelerate growth. And also large scale and manufacturing, we, although that has been the basis, there's a huge potential in that also to go further. So we need to focus on that manufacturing as a whole, both small and large, not to forget about the small. That should be the driving force. And the service sector, if in many industrial sector growth, service sectors will follow. Basically, it, 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 that's the normal story, and we expect that it will follow, but it will require its own policy dimensions and attention to the policy details which can, can be uh, considered in due course. This is what the industrial sector has been doing in Bangladesh. You can see that. It was the share of industry was 23.7% in 2000. Right now it is 30% plus. So it's an increase by about 8 percentage points, 7 percentage points. So that's a respectable increase. And this will continue, hopefully, for realizing the targets of the, of the Delta Plan 2031 and, and, and beyond. And we, I put here the China context just to see how far is we are still behind? You look at, at its peak, the Chinese industrial sector was 48% almost of GDP, which is very, very high, unusually high. No country in the world had probably seen ever in the history that high proportion of industrial sector. It's not needed, perhaps. So China is over-industrialized and it's paying some price for it and, and it's adjusting from that. So China is, uh, has reached its peak in industrial growth. And the share is now slowly, but surely you can see it's coming down. And coming down quite rapidly. So from 48% it's now 40.5%. And it will decline further. But Bangladesh has to be set 20 years behind China. So we have to increase. I'm not saying we have to, we have to go to 47, 48%. But we have to go to something like 40, 40 plus percent and then mature at that point. And we are right now at about 30. So about 8 to 10% additional increase in industrial sector will be desirable to pick out. And then we'll see the transformation on that side is done, and then service sector will slowly pick up again, and, and, and industrial sector will contract. But agriculture is, 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 will be continuously on a downward trend in a relative term. So that's the structure of the economy that we want to foresee in the coming years. It includes construction, of course. 
it's a, it's a, it's a three category breakdown agriculture, uh, industry, and service. So it encompasses construction, utilities, uh, everything. In China, also service. In China, also, same, same basis we try to. It has to. Look, in the US, in the 1700, 98% people live in the, in the farm area, in, the, in, the, in, in agriculture lands. Now 2%, and going down. How far go down from 2%, I don't know, but <laughs> it's, it's going down. So, so ours is, uh, is not be much different. Uh, eventually, we hope if the country is successful, that should be the outcome. Nothing to regret, nothing to fret about it. That's the uh, optimum outcome for a society to transform itself. Uh, and 2% can fit 98, uh, other 98%. So what's the problem? And plus export. So you don't really need that many people in agriculture with the mechanization and all the things that has happened. And it will allow you to increase productivity and wages and income for the rural people. So whoever is left, they will have much better life than uh, when they, when they live 70%, 80% living in rural areas. They've had much worse life than they would be living now and in future, if this, if this transformation happens. So, so Bangladesh's success depends on expanding manufacturing or industrial sector in this category. And the way we see it in the Delta Plan of the government, which is um, still a draft, the transformation, if you look at it, from 1990, industrial sector was 19.1%. It's increased to 31%. So 1990 till now, it has increased by 12 percentage points in relative share. And from now to another, in an, another 15 years' time, we expect it to increase by another 12 percent. So that's the transformation and the fast-paced transformation that is being targeted. And you can see how rapidly the in agriculture sector has declined from 29%, 28.7%. Currently, it is now 15.3%. And it will be halved, hopefully. But not the absolute level of production. Production will probably double or triple by then, agriculture. But the relative share will decline to only 7% by 2030. So that is the way things are moving. Now. Certainly, both the government and private sector has critical roles to play in this high growth environment that's envisaged for the country. Government role will essentially be limited to one, number one, provision of infrastructure, such as power, roads, bridges, airways, these uh, railways, airports, and this and that. And the second important thing is, which is lagging much behind also, is the enforcement of regulations and laws, such as environmental protection, industrial zoning, labor issues, all kinds of regulatory functions, government needs to step up and do much more proactively than what they're doing now. Private sector role, which will be the presentation's main content in future, in, uh, as I go down, will be to increase investment in an environmentally and socially sustainable manner. And I underscore the environmental and social part. And social part encompasses both relations with workers, working conditions, environment, all those things that has to be addressed by the private sector. The structural transformation has another part, which is the social distribution of employment part. And you can see the red line, red, red uh, zone. That's the zone that we are targeting, actually, because we know that currently most of the workers are still employed in agriculture, and the reduction has not been that much. Um, only recently, in 2010, it came down slightly below 50%. The 50% threshold, uh, agriculture was accounting for more than 50% of employment. That's not a good news for a country. It needs to rapidly diminish. And the decline has happened only since 2010, below 15%, below 50%. And that's why this is widened. And that is the pace that needs to be further, further widened. If you project it for future, you should see a red line, red zone increasing rapidly. And that will be the thrust of industrial policy, industrial 
uh, strategy for the government in future and, and the underlying employment policy also. I'm just giving few dimensions here. You can see that seventh plant, what it wants to achieve, um, sectoral, industry sector share to increase from to 35%. That's a major undertaking, of which manufacturing about 24.5% from current 20.8%. Increasing, so this will require this, this $50 billion export target, all those things is built into that kind of projections. Uh, if not, I don't think full 50 has been factored in. It's about 45 probably factored into this, uh, this projection. So private investment has to increase, including FDI, which is part of that. And that's, that's about five percentage points. That's a lot. It has, that has been the biggest disappointment in the last seven years. Not much has happened. It has been stable at 21, 22 percent, what it is now. And gross national income to go exceed $2,000 by the end of the five-year plan. That will require two things. One is the growth, and the other is the macroeconomic stability, which will underpin the exchange rate stability. Because, you know, in the past, we have grown in taka terms, but not in dollar terms. So only in the recent years, last, last one decade, I would say, with the exchange rate stability, we have seen the rapid growth in dollar terms. GNI, and that brought our this middle income status crossing threshold happening earlier than expected happened because of that transformation. This stability of the exchange rate. It's very important that macro stability is sustained in that. And we have to create 2.5 million new jobs. Why 2.5 million? Because additional labor force is about 2.1 million, 2 to 2.1 million. At additional 0 0.4 million will be needed to reduce job creation to reduce underemployment in the economy, which is seriously prevailing. So we need to create at the rate of additional employment to be generated at the rate of 2.9 million, and excess employment has to be about 0.8%, and of which only 4, 400,000 will be going abroad. So that's the projection built in. So domestic requirement for job creation is 2.5 million. It's a major, major undertaking for the economy. Now, so economic growth has to go hand in hand with sustainable development. And government has prepared also a national sustainable development strategy, what's called NSDS, in line with, which is pretty much in line with the SDG, although it was done a little bit ahead of SDG, but it's, it's fairly aligned. Um, to meet the challenges for economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Now, industry is rightly identified as the most important sector in the NSDS, although the challenges are also coming from industry because pollution, environmental degradation, water pollution, all those things are results of two, two, two elements, urbanization, and industrialization. But these are necessary evils. We have to have them. Urbanization will give you what you call the agglomeration effect. That means productivity gains will come primarily through agglomeration effect of industries and urbanization. And that's the only way every country has got higher productivity. And Bangladesh cannot be an exception. So we have to have urbanization. It's a, it's a wasteful dream to say that, well, we'll keep our population in rural areas. No, they're not going to stay in rural areas. They will come to urban areas. As you have come, as I have come, my fathers have come, they will come. So we have to share the space with them. <laughs> Issue is that how do you manage that process? That's one. And that job has to be created in both service as well as in industrial sector. So we have to create the industrial clusters and so on and engage them and engage them there and make them living in those areas for productive employment purpose. So these are necessary evils. We have to live with it. We have to manage them. We have to uh, manage them for our own sustainable growth. So necessarily, this is what the SDZ is essentially pointing out, that there are three pillars for economic sustainable growth. 
is the economic prosperity, social equity, and environmental stewardship. So without that, without the inclusive growth, without that industrial sector and industrialists and business community also contributing to the community, social equity cannot be achieved. Without industrials, industries paying the taxes, social equity cannot be achieved. And if social equity is not there, there will be social injustice and there will be social pushback. And we have seen countries becoming dysfunctional when their society does not want to move with the planners or the upper class and so on and so forth. So we have to, we cannot forget the masses. So economic prosperity can bring resources, but it has to be equitably distributed to ensure social equity. And there comes the fiscal policy role. There comes also the corporate social responsibility to its own community. And environmental stewardship on the part of the private sector primarily, and the government as a regulator has to come also. So these are the three pillars for our sustained development goal, sustainable development strategy. Now, relatively rapid transformation has also made Bangladesh industries and society face numerous problems. We know that. We have seen RMG story. We have seen our brick fields. We have seen uh, the pollution of our rivers all across uh, surrounding all, all the four rivers in Dhaka city. Um, we have seen the unplanned urbanization and industrialization that has made Dhaka city unlivable. And the industrial belts around Dhaka, like Ashuria, Sawa, Tungi, Nayanganj, completely turned to spoiled lands, essentially. Dumping of chemicals, no roads, no school, no civic amenities for the workers and the managers and people living around that neighborhood. Absolutely unplanned. And that cannot be a sustainable way. We cannot think of that garment industry becoming from 25 to $100 billion economy in 15 to in 10 to 12 years' time. And still, we will be growing as we have been grown, like Ashulia and, and Tongi and those areas, because those are not actually something to be proud of. They don't provide the basic civic rights to the people living in those areas, the workers in particular. So what I said is that mindless drive for profit without regard for impact of industrialization will not be sustainable. This has to go into the heart and mind of the entrepreneurial class. That yes, we will go for profit, but not mindlessly for profit. We have to share with the community and make the community prosper, we will prosper. What it requires, essentially, is that our private sector must find ways to sustain its industrial progress. We need better corporate decision making, which will encompass not profit only, but other dimensions of sustainability of the business. What are those? Some of those are, I already mentioned, social responsibility implies public pressure towards society's economic and human resources, and a willingness to see those resources are used for the broad social ends, and not simply narrow interest of the private persons or firms. Not only for the private sector, narrow profit motive only. In short, business decision is to make a broader social and environmental aspects into its consideration. Air and water pollution, I don't need to repeat the story. Essentially, Dhaka, Bangladesh is the least, um, le uh, I mean, worst environment, one of the worst environmentally disaster zone of the world. Second was Dhaka City. Second was, but as a country. <laughs> also. Uh, uh, second was is the Dhaka City. And, and there was, the day before yesterday, there was this warning from the US Embassy, don't go out, it's, it's hazardous to move around in Dhaka. <laughs> so, all four rivers 
Baridhara being more suggestive, just imagine what would be the other places in Dhaka. <laughs> All four rivers in Dhaka are dead. And uh, there's not even a single living fish can, that can swim in that river. <laughs> it's, it's so deadly, <laughs> poisonous. So we have to deal with this, this uh, ways of treating our chemicals, effluents, and, uh, and fecal pollutions, and spillage, and low, uh, all, the, all these issues needs to be addressed. Challenges for sustainability? In the case of garment sector, we face the challenges. The Rana Plaza, Tazreen, and all those things were the wake-up calls. Some major changes has happened, which is positive. A lot more has to happen more in the future as well. It's not that, that everybody is compliant. No, it's very far from that. Maybe 100 factories or 200 factories or 500 factories are compliant, but there is 3,500 or 4,200 factories. God knows what's the real number, nobody knows. Even the BGMs, they will say this is our number, but they are more beyond their number. So essentially, majority factories are even outside the review process, outside the inspection process. So we should not be complacent that our industry has taken care of. Yes, BGME is taking credit. They should deserve credit. But we have to keep in mind that there are a lot more beyond them. There are a lot more subcontracting firms which are operating in the same area and doing the same thing, but under much different, much worse conditions of working conditions than they are doing. So this is a task that the government has to take responsibility, not accord an alliance. They only ensure their supplier chain up to a point. But then there will be many others who will be left out and the many workers, millions of workers, who will be under threat. And the government has to step in to ensure, and the private sector also, that they, are, they work in the safe environment. And not only safe in terms of the building, but once they're out of the building, they also have to have a safe living in that area. That's also the responsibility of the private sector and the government. So it's not only the catastrophic it's accidents. We have to think beyond that. Impact of wet processing sector alone is, 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 is a matter of concern. I'm giving some few, few uh, observations here. There are about 1,700 textile wet processing units in Bangladesh. It's a very inefficient way they're doing business. I mean, we are now the number one denim producer in the world. We're very proud of it. I am also. But also, why everybody is coming to process their denim in Bangladesh? Because it's the most chemical in intensive fabric uh, in the world, chemically treated. This, the amount of chemical discharged by the denim factories are enormous, and they're all dumped in our rivers and without impunity. So essentially, the social cost will be borne by us. Private sector is making the profit for now. Foreign companies are all placing order because Chinese are stopping it. They don't want to allow anymore. Others don't want their doors open as well, so they're coming to Bangladesh in mass. So, we'll, so we will remain uh, good uh, um, growth in that sector, but at what cost? We need to assess that because it's a social cost. It's not an economic cost. And we, the, the private sector has to take the responsibility for this, this loss to the country. Huge loss. We are using 300 liters per kg. 300 liters of water per kg to wash. Whereas the global industrial standard is 50 to 60 kg. So we're wasting water, five times more water we're using because we don't pay anything for our water. And the, these factories are all located around Dhaka city and Narayan Ganj, and a few in Chittagong. So the water level in Dhaka is going down because they don't even want to bother to use the river water, which is polluted. Number one, they have to treat it. It's costly, so they go under underground water. No other country allows to use underground water for industrial uses in mass. So we are using, exploiting underground water, and the water level is going down around Dhaka city. How much water they use? It's a four or five year old estimate. According to that, the 1,700 textile mills, wet processing textile factories are using as much water as the 12 million inhabitants of Dhaka city at that time, every day. So the 12 million citizens, the amount of water we're consuming for our day-to-day -day operations, the 1,700 factories are using the same amount of water, all from deep wells. 
So they're sucking up the water level. That's not sustainable. Now imagine, you want to double your export? You want to quadruple your export? All those are possible, as I said, in the chart, which shows very nicely. What will be the impact on our water level? What will be the impact on our pollution level? What will be the impact on our living conditions for us and for our children? So these are the serious social impacts that business community, as part of the society, have to take the responsibility to address. And they have to cooperate. Government alone cannot do it, but they have to do it. So I, I want to move fast because we have many other speakers. Similar challenges exist in other sectors. Um, not only it's in RMG, but uh, certainly in, 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 in leather and in shipbuilding, in engineering, in, in plastic industry. These are all chemical based and they have s similar problems. They are, they are even not in our radar, except for, except for uh, leather. Everything else is not in our radar. There is not much talk going on but they are growing, growing fast. Plastic industry is growing very rapidly. I welcome that, but there is a, there's a cost. So challenges for sustainability in the leather sector, for example, is that 21,600 cubic meters of environmentally hazardous waste, including chromium, sulfur, ammonium, are emitted daily, 21,600 cubic meter, daily from the tenneries according to our Department of Environment. It's a huge, huge number. And, of course, our processing industry and our, our leather industry is going to go very fast. It is already $1.4 billion industry export and is going to f go much faster in the coming days. So we have to tackle this as well. Not only the migration to Savar will solve the problem because there will be many more industries coming up and we have to cater to those. So unplanned urbanization, I said already, I will not repeat those things here. Another problem is that our energy. And we all know that government is going for coal-based uh, power plants in future. It is essential to some extent, I agree, but it has its cost. Environmental cost is serious. Um, according to the master plans, by 20, um, 24 coal power, power plants projects are, are going to be undertaken, major, major projects, generating about 17,000 megawatt of electricity, which will be more than 40%, 45% of our power production will come from coal. So total coal requirement associated with that will be 60 million, 60 million tons per year. Imagine how much right now only 2% of the very small base of our electricity is coming from coal, 2%. It will become 45%, and on a higher base. So it's a massive amount of air pollution that we have not seen that's going to come our way. And I don't know what will be done in future. There are certain other ways of doing it. Uh, government probably has to put more attention to those, including non-renewable -ren ones, plus trade of electricity from India. India is producing huge amount of electricity. And we have our bordering countries like Nepal, Bhutan, and, 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 and also uh, Indian state of uh, Urunachal um, in the east. They have huge reservoirs of uh, potential hydropower. We can tap on those, but will require much more bi bilateral col collaboration with India. It has been successful to some extent. We are getting about um, 200 megawatt plus, but we can easily increase this many, many fold in future if we do, do it engagement productively, mutual benefit. So, so we have to look towards clean energy down the line. CSR in Bangladesh is a very poor state. I must thank our former governor, Atul Rahman, that at least he has introduced it for the banking sector uh, to a limited extent. Uh, so it exists only um, among the banks, uh, and they report to some extent. But there is no co structured CSR activity in Bangladesh, frankly. It's more ad hoc. So mainstreaming CSR in Bangladesh, in, in banks and financial institutions in Bangladesh was done 
in part by Bangladesh Bank. But in addition, as an environmental responsible body, Bangladesh Bank issued circulars and guidelines on green banking and environmental risk management. So Bangladesh Bank is trying to do their part of it. And I welcome that in that regard. Um, so banking sector has, a, has become the most important CSR player in Bangladesh because of that proactive engagement. But fact of the matter is that CSR is just the beginning of a long journey in the case of Bangladesh. And I think that um, CSR may also be blended with this uh, social business concept of Professor Yunus, because that's a, that's a nice way that he has coined it and it's becoming quite reasonably popular. And his main concept is that, that a charity dollar has only one life. If you donate it, it's only one life. But a social business dollar can be recycled multiple times. So that's what the, what the core of his merit of his social business concept. That you give money, it's giving it once. But if you use it in social business, you, every product cycle, you use the same money again and again. So there is a multiplier effect, and we should go for that multiplier effect instead of the old-fashioned charity. So that's his concept. And that's, I think that's the core of his principle, and that is a valid principle. And we should explore it in our national interest. Now, so Gamin is doing its own area. Yeah, there's some international collaboration and some of the activities are happening, but it has not been main scale. Nationally, it has not been owned. And maybe something that we should, we should, we should look into, forgetting about the divisions and so on in the society. Now, what more can be done? Of course, um, it's a responsibility of the business community to the population. Because after all, what is the CS, why CSR is important? Why it is morally the right thing? It's because business is deriving the benefit from the people. Without the people, there is no business. Absolutely no. So it is in the interest of the business community to look after the welfare of the people, from which they are deriving the benefit at the end. So it's a morally imperative on the business community as a minimum to serve the community where it works, where it does its business. It has to do it. There are some global initiatives also. And my suggestion is that Bangladesh enterprises should join global reporting initiatives with respect to their corporate social responsibility. There's structured phenomena, how it should be done, how it should be reported, and so on and so forth. And Bangladesh government should also push the private sector towards that direction in future. Yes, and five minutes I'll finish it. Okay, leadership role. I think our business leadership like MCCI, BCCI and all others should look beyond their immediate business interest and also look at the broader social dimension of the business activity. Business is not limited to making money. Business is to develop making money along with the development of the community and the nation. That broader dimension has to happen. It's missing from our, our, our um, business associations and leadership and not focusing in that way. They should start thinking in that dimension. Their agenda should include those broader areas as part of their responsibility to the community as a minimum. And there are other practices also, which has to be addressed, like bad cultures in our society, non-performing loans. It's not right. They have to speak out and, and say that we, and, and also do the in-house work to single them out and, and, and throw them out of the associations and things so that it's, it's a punishable offense from their association as well as from the legal front as well as from the social front. So, those are some of the things that they should look at. So this is our NPL story and so on. Now, I think that if Bangladesh can adhere to the SDG objectives, it will be achieving most of these concerns as well. SDG is a very comprehensive document and government is committed to that, but it has the pillars which are very, very integrated 
and the social and environmental dimension are very highly focused, along with industrialization and employment generation. So focus is not narrowly on industrialization and employment generation, but environmental issues, safety issues, all those issues are very, very ingrained in the SDG framework. Thankfully, I must say, the seventh five-year plan and the Delta plan, all these have been aligned with the SDG objectives of the government. So if they can deliver on those plans to, to a large extent, it will make a significant progress towards that. But I'm afraid that the focus on many of these environmental issues are still not in the, in the priority list of the government, unfortunately, as of now. I believe that if the government, which it is focusing on now, the serviceable land for industrialization, that's 100 economic zones and so on, if they can focus on that and build up sufficient number, I'm not talking about 100, I'm talking about 15 for now, industri industrial zones, and try to push all the new industries towards them, many of these objectives can be achieved without too much effort because pollution issue can be addressed centrally, so the central ETP in those economic zones, so nobody can pollute because the others will complain, they are living in the same zones. And so that alone not only solves the problem of supply of land, but will address many of the indirect the concerns that are coming out of uh, haphazard industrialization and, 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 and um, not catering to the, to the social needs of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the business operation. That can be addressed if they are located in certain uh, designated areas, unlike what it is now. So that will help, in my view. So I believe that sustainable land and chemical and waste management may go together. So that's, that's what to underline here. Finally, I say that concluding slide is that Bangladesh has a good track record and indicates that achieving higher growth over medium and long term is a distinct and realistic possibility. We can do that. We can do that. But there is no scope for complacency. I just, in my Washington visit, I also heard the stories of African countries where they're having what you call premature industrialization. That means they have industrialized and they're going down prematurely, not a 40% of GDP, but perhaps at 20%. They matured and now coming down to 14%. And that's a disaster in the making. So we cannot afford that premature industrialization in Bangladesh. So there is, should not be any scope for complacency. Both the government and the private sector must play well-defined roles in their respective areas and hold each other accountable for not doing their part. We must also remember that business as usual is not an option. That will lead to environmental degradation and serious human health problem and will make Bangladesh unlivable. Let me be very honest. Many of us are sending our children abroad and they're not going to come back. Why? Several things. Governance issue. Even the highest government people, they're sending their children out of the country. And when we ask them privately why, they said that they will not be able to survive in this country. I survived, I did well, but I don't believe my children will be able to survive in this country. In this regulatory environment, in this corruption-prone system, they will not be navigated as I can. So they're more comfortable with a predictable governance regime, predictable environment for investments and so on. So we have to change our mindset that if you want to bring our people, children back, this country has to be made livable. And livability is a very broad concept. It's not only that the roads are less congested. It's not only that neighborhoods are clean. It's not only that you, you are a little safe at your home. You will not be picked up. It's not only that, uh, that uh, uh, it's that you have to be able to do your business without being threatened by anybody else. And so those are the basic ingredients for your livability for the future generation in this country. You have to do that. Otherwise, we'll see huge, huge capital flight, which it is happening now. 
And that's a major concern to me, as intergenerational shift. So only through responsible ways of doing business will Bangladesh be able to sustain high economic growth and become an industrial country by 2050. And we hope for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hassan Mansur, for your very elaborate uh, keynote presentation. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Hassan Mansur has uh, uh, helped shape much of the economic policy in Bangladesh, both in his uh, earlier uh, life as a senior executive of the International Monetary Fund and now as an economic uh, policy advisor. Uh, in the, uh, and he's working closely with the government and many economic policy uh, formulations. What has come, uh, uh, the recurring theme in his keynote has been socially and environmentally responsible business. Time and time again, he came back to this concept, and uh, this is uh, actually quite important. Uh, uh, I, will, I would like to uh, hear from the uh, discussants on many of these issues. He's also talking about the future direction that uh, we are taking in terms of the gradual uh, degree, uh, you know, lowering in the non-farm input to our economy, the uh, gradual uh, uh, targeting of uh, higher per capita income across the board, like $2,000 by, by the end of the current five-year plan and $5,000 by 2031. So all of these are uh, you know, very positive uh, indicators. So uh, I would like to now hear from the uh, uh, discussants. So I will first uh, come to Mr. Rubayat Jamil, uh, who is the managing director of ICE Technologies and is a member of the uh, MCCI uh, board. So, uh, Rubaya, you have the floor for five minutes now. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I think after Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Hassan Mansour's speech, ex explaining anything becomes very difficult. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight here, because one of the things that kept on repeating during uh, the Dr. Mansour's speech is about being responsible and taking responsible decisions. Because of time short, because of uh, lack of time, I would like to highlight one point which I think is very important when we talk about developing partners. Uh, one of the main things that his, uh, his presentation also focused on was developing the manufacturing sector. A manufacturing sector will not develop if the supply chain is not set up, and a supply chain will not perform properly if partnerships are not, not set up. Another thing he said was better corporate decision making. So that's the point I would like to highlight with everyone's uh, permission. When we talk about better corporate decision making, when we talk about partnerships, I think most important is negotiating. This is some place where culturally we fail because we think that whenever I am in a position of power, negotiating with someone who is not in the same power structure as I am, I have the right to squeeze him more. And this is where 99% of our partnerships fail, and this is why we cannot set up a strong supply chain management. Negotiating is very similar to squeezing a lemon. A lemon is fantastic. We squeeze, a lemon juice comes out, we love it. After a point, it becomes sour. It's exactly the same thing. When you're negotiating, as Richard Branson said, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time, negotiate hard, but do not negotiate to a point where one party is leaving the negotiating table feeling that he has been taken advantage of. Because when you're taking the decision, decision as a leader, you have the responsibility to take care of your partner also. And that's where negotiating skills come, in, come into the process. A perfect negotiation is where both partners shake hands and leave the table thinking that I'm going to help the other partner grow. And that is what Bangladesh needs right now. We need to negotiate hard as businessmen in an ethical environment, responsibly, so that we take care of our partners. Our government needs to negotiate hard with our foreign partners so that everyone comes into a win-win situation, so that we can attain the goal that we are, th we are thinking about. And as Dr. Mansoor rightly concluded, that the only way to develop is to create a responsible business environment where we can control the sustainable growth. And I think if we negotiate properly with our partners, both internal and external, we'll be able to create this atmosphere. Thank you, Gorimbai. Oh, thank you very much, Rubayat. You've kept within the time. And uh, no, it's actually uh, it's always a tough session to do after lunch, uh, you, you know, and especially with a, such a difficult topic. So, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing that uh, none of you are dozing off. So if any of you are, please raise your arm. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so nobody is sleeping. That's good. <laughs> so we'll go to the next designated discussant, uh, Dr. Muhammad Abu Yusuf, Professor, Department of Development Studies, University of Dhaka. So, uh, Dr. Yusuf, you have the floor for five minutes now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a nice presentation by Dr. Uh, uh, Mansoor. Uh, and uh, he is uh, known as our guru, so it's very difficult to say something on his presentation. But uh, I think it was an excellent presentation on the issues covering basically responsible ways of doing business in a high growth environment. So um, uh, we all know that um, uh, Bangladesh is working on the path of 6.5% growth over the last one decade. Uh, and uh, already we entered uh, into the lower medium income category country and also lower medium human uh, development category country. But now we are working uh, for the middle income country, how can we step down uh, by 2021. But um, as a student, as a student of economics, whether growth is enough, we know that growth is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. So now it's our uh, role that how we can make the growth uh, more inclusive or poor or more sustainable. And uh, as mentioned by um, Dr. Asan Ismunsur, that uh, uh, we need to focus on uh, social environment and economic, not only economic, if we want to make the growth uh, sustainable. And he rightly mentioned that we need to expand. There is a scope for expansion of manufacturing sector by another um, uh, 8 to 10 percent. Uh, and also, uh, on the other hand, agricultural sector, you know, share of GDP may be decreasing. But in the absolute term, um, the agricultural productivity um, is increasing. We are um, self-sufficient on agricultural sector. But um, the main issue is, you know, we should not be happy with the, that self-sufficiency. We need to focus on the nutrition issues. Uh, we had a session yesterday that, uh, you know, Bangladesh has uh, many challenges also uh, in meeting the nutrition goals, particularly on the uh, underweight um, stunting, wasting uh, issues. So we need to focus on that if we want to make this growth process um, inclusive and we want to, if we want to bring all the segments um, in the, and the, um, and also, Sir mentioned uh, two issues, that is, what should be the role of government and what should be the role of private sector. And if we get the answer of these two issues, uh, I think uh, the answer will be there. That is, role of government provision of infrastructure. Whether we have the infrastructure, we have the growth, but, you know, we all confess that with sluggish investment. But why investment is not coming up, particularly from the private sector? So whether we are in a position to create an anabolic environment so that, uh, you know, in a market economy, there is a, we say that there is no role of government, but there is a role of government in terms of social welfare, in terms of environmental uh, protection related, in terms of uh, other citizens' welfare related. I think with the, with the in, in the arena of, you know, there are some market failure because of some weak institutions. So I think we need to focus on growth, development, and institutions. If we can combine with this, then I think um, as we want to see Bangladesh as a uh, medium uh, development country, income development country by 21, that can be possible. On the other end, load of role of private sector, you know, sometimes we say that this is a private sector-led uh, growth, whatever the growth we have. So, um, and he mentioned that uh, increased investment in an environmentally and socially sustainable manner. So, whether we, we, we are doing this, so for that we can ask the question whether the government is performing their role, whether there should not be any market failure, uh, that the market economy can be performed in the market in a sustainable way. On the other hand, whether private sector that they are making their role. And also, you know, uh, with, with regard to CSR activities, um, already banking sectors, there is some regulations in the banking sector um, introduced by Bangladesh Bank. But there is, a, I think, it's time to think of a CSR law. India has a CSR law, and in that law, they embedded that 2% of their income must be spent on CSR activities. And also, they developed a guideline 
uh, on these issues. So I think we can think of it, you know, other than banking sector, uh, CSR, also in the banking sector, it's like something philanthropic activities or something like that. So we need to make a regulatory framework so that this CSR money can be spent in a sustainable way. And other things can be, um, I think, thought, uh, this some food for thought, that is, we, can we use this CSR money for social business activities or social enterprise activities so that it can also um, create some employment opportunities and also it can uh, it can play a role in the in the in the economy so in this way and also uh, as we mentioned that we are heavily dependent on ready made garment sector 82% of our income come from uh, ready made garments but uh, you know we there are some factories out of 4000 4500 factories they have already lead certified and also number one uh, denim factory in the world number one textile factory in the world we are we feel proud of them but you know many of the factories also they are not um, environmentally friendly on you know they have etp and they, they are not using it so we need to think of it so whether government there are some regulations i think we are flooded with rules and regulations but it's not enforcement issues is the uh, next issue. So I think we need to uh, think of it and uh, uh, the readiness of the private sector to adhere socially responsible ways of doing business. Uh, the current state, what I have found from the um, um, literature that uh, are um, based on my experience that corporate, um, that is reluctance to take responsibilities for the social Particularly, you know, if I mention that, for just for an example, I am not highlighting any particular factory, except for Envoy, Envoy textile industry, number one denim uh, in the world. But they have developed a social uh, business model. Business, they are doing business, but there are some social uh, business model uh, over there. What I have seen uh, from the, uh, because recently I have done one work on uh, green growth initiative, green in initiative in the ready-made garment sector. And then reckoning uh, the role of mandatory corporate reporting in enhancing corporate accountability. So we have seen very, very low level of reporting from the uh, private sector level. And also achieving such accountability, however, will not be easy due to lack of political will. So we need to think of that also. But filling some gaps, I think, uh, could serve the purpose of improving private sector adherence to responsible ways of doing business. Number one, awareness gaps because many of the business persons are often not aware of uh, business obligations and the consequence of uh, non-compliance. This is number one. Number two, support and service gap, that is business persons don't have the proper environment for compliance. So we need to create the environment as well. Then motivation gap, business persons don't receive a uh, psychological premium to disclose a higher income so so that they can um, uh, pay their corporate tax and others so we need to create that environment as well um, and then environmental gap that is business persons are habitual defaulters and are inclined to disobey rules and resolutions so i think if we if we focus on these gaps and uh, uh, and if government can play their uh, role and also private sector they know their uh, they should know their what should be their role i think we can see a positive bangladesh in the near future you know just let me quote one uh, book uh, from jeffrey sachs that uh, in his book uh, on the end of poverty he mentioned four countries bangladesh india china and malay and he mentioned bangladesh is on the ladder of economic development. I think we are on the ladder of it, economic development and there is the room for uh, improvement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yusuf, uh, for your uh, <clears throat> very learned uh, intervention on this topic. Uh, I will not comment on any of these uh, interventions now, maybe at the end if there is time. Maybe I'll make some closing remarks. So I'll now come to our next uh, designated discussant. Uh, uh, let me, because it's very, uh, you know, there is no gender balance on, the, on this table or, on the, or in the audience. So I'll come to the only uh, lady discussant we have, Dr. Farazi Binti Firdos, uh, who is a, a research fellow of SANEM. You can, Oh, so you want to go to the podium? So you can give me one of those names. Okay, all right, sure, no problem. <coughs> Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Chair, for giving me this opportunity. I was really looking forward to engage myself to the uh, speakers already have spoken. So we already know the topic is the responsible ways of doing business in a high growth environment. As you already had a very detailed picture from um, the Dr. Ahsan H. Mansour's presentation. So based on that detail, let me go through my slides. So those who missed yesterday's um, panel discussion, which was named as the high level panel discussion, I would rename it as the highest possible level intellectual panel discussion happened uh, in Dhaka yesterday with Professor uh, Wahiduddin Mahmood and Professor Rehman Sopan and of course Professor Selim Raihan and all other distinguished fellows. So taking his quote uh, that uh, Sanem has tweeted like uh, he raised the issue like how to match individual capacities with the economic opportunities which are related with growth. So taking this point, I would like to take uh, an, uh, this opportunity to uh, place my, um, how to say, uh, statement, or it shouldn't be <laughs> a statement, my logic here. And I was trying to using these slides to have a visual effect. Like from Professor uh, Wahidud Mahmoud's statement, I saw how he could uh, relate and uh, show us these individual capacities um, take us um, takes uh, us to social opportunities and which where corporates plays the role and those. Uh, utilizing those opportunities properly, those economic opportunities and other opportunities properly, theoretically should lead us to national and um, state level growth. And that finally should take us for global development. So what I'm trying to show you here, every single stage and level have their own uh, interest here. So all the players have their own interest here and they have to play their own roles to make this high level growth uh, effective and sustainable. Now, taking again Professor Rehman Soban's um, quote, at the end of the day, inequality is an outcome, whereas inclusion is both an outcome and a process. So I would like to put emphasis on this, his quotation, where he She's, uh, he tried to tell us what, how the process works, and I was trying to think how corporates can play its role, their role in it. So when individual capacities can be connected properly with those social economic opportunities, and of course corporates can create those uh, appropriate jobs and other uh, facilities, and also uh, we know that state, um, the small, uh, sector, medium sector, and also international level sectors all relates to the uh, individual level, to the state level, the society, and international uh, economic channel. So that's how I was trying to see how everybody's interest re, uh, is interconnected and it, the responsibility is not only on the shoulder of the corporates and the cheesy um, term the corporate social responsibility, which is new for our country, but which is a very common and uh, quite an old term for the international um, developed countries. What um, I was trying to uh, tell you the story uh, where why uh, the, the interest would uh, be in different levels. For example, as uh, Dr. Hassan H. Mansur already mentioned, and also Professor Raihan, like the social um, sustainable development goals, particularly if we look at um, goal 12, which um, says that it requires a systemic approach and cooperation among actors operating in the supply chain from producers to the final consumer, because this um, consumption and production is about promoting resource and energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, and providing access to basic services, green and decent jobs. It's not only the job, we uh, talk about decent jobs, and a better quality of life for all. So um, this was uh, my idea of like why state should not only look at the development, which is only 
um, economic development, but also to reach those uh, SDGs within 2030 and also to go further. They have their own interest and they should uh, play their roles while setting the policies. Again, um, just taking a simple story from Professor Raihan and uh, Dr. Abu Shamcha's uh, work, uh, which um, ended last year, um, they have uh, studied uh, a private sector targeted skill development program, and they found that um, the program was quite successful in terms of including migration and sourcing a formal wage employment at the urban uh, destinations, and they found evidence that the training program improved the asset holding of the participants and uh, many more. But the puzzle was still there that why the entrepreneurs were not uh, interested in uh, providing the skill development trainings, and maybe the entrepreneurs uh, know it better, but the puzzle was not clearly solved through the uh, analysis. So here, uh, my next slide uh, would try to tell you how we can uh, encourage the entrepreneurs and to, if we show them a win-win situation, I, I'm trying to take this um, story. It was back in 2012. The Guardian produced that um, the renowned Novartis uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry, it, its story about. They saw a shared value opportunity in selling their pharmaceuticals in rural India, where 70% of the population lives. The obstacle uh, was not the price they charged, but the social conditions in the region, a chronic lack of health-seeking behavior in the community, healthcare providers with virtually no healthcare training, and tens of thousands of local clinics without a reliable supply chain. So looking through a shared value lens, Novartis saw this social problem as business opportunities. They hired hundreds of community health educators held training camps for providers and build up a distribution system to 50,000 rural clinics. So for the business side, the Novartis, the result was an entirely new business model that is essential to their future. And re please remember this was a story written on 2012, but um, the recent situation must be um, a different one and a better one. And for 12, 42 million people in India, the results our access to a vastly improved level of healthcare that neither government nor the NGOs were providing. So from the previous uh, example, it was the role of the uh, development partners and uh, NGOs. And here we can see the, how the private sector can uh, find their ways to make profit and also to include themselves in the social inclusion. So um, if we go back to this, uh, visual impact. Like, my point is here, like, let's uh, encourage all the players here to play their own roles, and as, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Rubat Jamil has mentioned, there is a place for negotiation, and no one can play their role alone. So let's uh, put our shoulders together, and so that the business sector doesn't think like it's like a seen the bus ghost on their own shoulder and they feel encouraged and they feel the partnership and with due respect uh, to uh, Dr. Asan H. Monsu, like let them go away who doesn't love our country and we have 16 uh, crore people here so we have our strong shoulders to take the burdens and all the pollutions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Firdos, uh, for your thoughtful comments. Uh, so let me now invite our next discussant, uh, Mr. Khamdokar Mainuddin, who is a senior fellow at the Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, BCAS. Thank you, so, Honorable. Mr. Mainuddin, yeah. by the presenter, uh, Dr. Asan Mansoor. He has given, he has actually dealt with all aspects of economy, environment, and social issues. But I would like to highlight two or three points. And he has also given how economic transition takes place and 
But I am afraid this is agriculture. Two percent people re remain in agriculture and feed the 16 crore people. Given the climate change context, the way the climate is changing, a sudden flood or sudden drought can change the scenario to a great extent. And we have seen the food crisis of 2001, when even India did not want to sell food to us. So I think agriculture should be seen as a food security issue, as a poverty issue. So, and it is good that we are progressing very much, but the GDP is a very impressive growth, but it has been achieved at a very high cost of natural resource and environmental degradation. We have already destroyed our rivers. These are a common property resource, but now it has become a common liabilities, these rivers. The fishermen, the cannot use, cannot fish. Our agriculturists cannot irrigate, cannot find irrigation water, and it has become a dumping ground. And the principles that we pollute fast, then clean, just may not work. And it would be a serious situation, and China is actually realizing the situation. So I think we should be careful at the very beginning. And it is the poor who bear the burden. Even the rich are not free from the air pollution. And what is the benefit if we have income, but we spend on medicine and in the hospital bill, and we don't have good health, and our workers have bad health, and they, their productivity will be low, and we will be in a vicious trap, and ultimately we will be not achieve our target of economic development. If we cannot tackle the environment, I saw a report just a few, years, a few days ago that the Holy River India is now at a dumping ground because of industrial human waste and household waste. And they have spent billions of dollars to restore the river, but they could not. And there is a report in, say, Indian Center for Environment, there is no flow of money in Ganges, in the Ganges, but no flow of water. The very serious situation. The Holy River has become a dirty river. Our Buriganga, the situation is no better. So we, I think we should be careful. The, we, should, we must be sensitive, the industry, society, civil society, government, for people's health and welfare. Only GDP cannot ensure welfare unless we can have clean water and clean fresh air to breathe. And that's becoming very expensive good. So I think it's a comprehensive approach. We should learn from China, and Dr. Hassan Mansour has given a very fine example in Africa. The industrial share went 14% now coming back. So we might be also in an environmental trap if you cannot take care of this. So I think we should be very much serious, and all actors have a role to play to clean the rivers and to just and I think the, it is an external cost. The industry must inter internalize, and the society as a whole should be responsive. There should be social mobilization, government alone can take, because the, it is a common property resource, clean air and fresh water. Everybody has a role to play. I think not only industry, civil society, researcher, government, and I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Manuddin, for uh, re-emphasizing the importance of keeping our environment and uh, social uh, you know, uh, goods intact, uh, despite our emphasis on simply GDP growth. So uh, I will now come to our last designated discussion since Tabith Awal uh, had to skip town, so couldn't make it to our uh, uh, workshop today or seminar today. So I'll, come to, uh, I'll now go to Dr. Munzur Hussain who is a senior research fellow at the Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies for his comments. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> when uh, our chair requested me to talk in the last, then I became a prey. <laughs> because there are might go to sleep. <laughs> uh, two reasons. Not only my sleep, there are two reasons. One is the uh, talking in the last has some merits and demerits. Merits is like that everybody touched up on all those things, so you have nothing to say. But demerits is that uh, audiences ex expect uh, some more from the speakers, so I have to add some more. That is very difficult to find at the last moment. Uh, I think, first of all, I think I thank uh, Sanem for uh, raising an important issue, uh, topical issue uh, at this moment. And uh, already uh, Hassan Bhai made a comprehensive presentation on various issues, but I want to touch upon some micro issues, and uh, that has not been touched upon so far, I understand. Uh, here, 
that if tight if you look at title there are two issues one is responsible business and another was high growth so if we uh, segregate two parts one is government public sector one is private sector so responsibility mm -hmm. lies with the both sectors mm -hmm. i want to start with two observations and i am asking the question in fact first of all if you look at the doing business indicator of bangladesh bangladesh remains in the uh, i think 142 or 43 mm -hmm. 2017 uh, ranking so why we are in that uh, situation? Who are responsible for this? Second observation is our tax GDP ratio is 10.8% uh, around, which is even lowest among the South Asian countries. So why we are not paying tax? Or with this low level of tax, how could we grow uh, in a sustainable manner? How we could uh, maintain a high growth regime? So, Perhaps if we don't pay tax, then we, we, we have to end up with a high, uh, le high level of debt and unsustainable debt regime. So I think uh, our situation is not that bad. So why and then we should come up uh, with some uh, explanation why we are in that situation. First of all, if we look at the doing business environment, and you know, before going to the business section, I am trying to uh, summarize some uh, government sectors or public sectors uh, responsibilities. For example, uh, gov uh, what are the uh, uh, responsibilities lie with the public sector or government? Maybe policy regime, liberalizing various policies and others. There are also tax regime, uh, which, are, which must be uh, business friendly. Uh, government has to also work with the financial sector development with some efficiency and other things. Also, the, the public sector has the responsibility to maintain a prudent macroeconomic, sound macroeconomic uh, environment. All those are conducive to the high economic growth. And uh, if we look at the 1990s or 80s, the government made a substantial trade, trade regime liberalization, also financial sector liberalization, the benefit of which we are now getting. But particularly, the business sector is uh, getting that benefit. At the same time, if we look at the financial sector, uh, though it has a certain level of development, but still if you look at the non-performing loan, who are the responsible for that? I think it lies with the business sector also. Also, the policy environment, regulatory environment that are not that much uh, stringent to uh, prohibit those kind of non-performing loan situations. Macroeconomic situation, as already mentioned in the keynote speech, that we are maintaining a good uh, macroeconomic situation for the last uh, decade or so. Uh, our inflation rate, our uh, growth rate, investment scenario, these are a certain level of uh, satisfaction we can say at this moment. So with all these things, then uh, we are achieving a certain level of growth and we are expecting more growth over the seven, five year plan period. Uh, now come to our business community uh, part. So uh, I want to start with some uh, few sections, in fact. Particularly, first of all, I want to highlight the SME sector. SME is, the, uh, is called as the engine of growth of an economy. So what are the situation of SMEs in Bangladesh? It contributes so far, uh, some studies show that 25% of GDP. It constitutes 99% of our industry sector. But uh, what are the regime, policy regime for this SME sector? SME still face uh, uh, lack of access to institutional finance. It has a uh, problem with the uh, regulatory framework. It has problem with the access to market. It has problem with the access to technology. Even we do not have a comprehensive strategy for SME development. So this sector, if we don't put these policy regimes and policy uh, incentives, how could ex ex a sector could grow, which are contributing to most of the uh, businesses. This is one uh, part. Second part, I want to start with three uh, more sectors. One is ICT, another one RMG, third one is leather. And, and also a, a bit with the agro, agro food or agro products. ICT, uh, our chair is one of the members, uh, was the president of BASIS one time. ICT sector places is vision one which is they want to raise their export earnings $1 billion by 29, uh, 19, 2019. Next year, 2018. <laughs> 2018. So they are now hardly earning $300 million by exporting. 700. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so far I have the six. It is basically 700. So they are playing, uh, they want to 
So what are the major uh, uh, hindrances or obstacles for growing ICT to that level? One is the, from ICT sector, says that skill gap is one of the main uh, problem. Middle level uh, managerial capacity people is lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a problem with the industry academia linkages, with the curriculum and other things. So what the businesses are doing to solve those th all those things? So th this is another question that I may ask to the uh, in even industry sector people. Uh, another point that I want to raise that has not been raised in many places, even I have been working on ICT sector for many years, uh, it's a kind of lack of professionalism among the ICT professions. So I have faced this kind of problem in recent times and I heard from others also. When you give a contract to ICT firm, they started working when you demand some uh, uh, customized things, then once they could not, they just opt out. This has happened in some uh, in some cases. It's, I am not generalizing this thing. So if you could not develop professionalism, then it is not possible to grow a sector to a certain level. And that is another point. RMZ, we are also uh, thinking to achieve $50 billion target of uh, export. We are now having about $30 billion export per year. But the key issue is compliance standard. This is not only for the government responsibility, this is the responsibility of the businesses. If they want to achieve that kind of level, they must have to become compliant with the international standard, workplace safety, and other things. Fortunately, some, uh, something is happening with the industrial accord and other things, but still we are far away from the uh, international standard. So this kind of things must have to be maintained by the uh, businesses so that they can grow by their own interest. Uh, leather sector, the same thing. Uh, government has allocated some uh, uh, spaces for them, uh, only in the suburb, but uh, the businesses are not willing to go there. But because they are thinking that com maintaining compliance in more co will be more costlier for their businesses, but they don't understand that this compliance, maintaining compliance is even better for them, for their own interest. So this is another thing that we have to maintain. And uh, uh, Compliance and then another issue comes for the businesses that is ethics of business. What uh, Asan Bhai says that mindless profit <laughs> may not be the only sole goal for the businesses, but who will prohibit them uh, making this profit? Our, if we, our regulatory regime is not like this. If we, uh, face this uh, if we face the governance problem, then it is not possible to maintain that kind of uh, mindless profiting. For example, food adulteration. This is a big problem. People are making profit out of this at the cost of environment, at the cost of health of other people. And that is not uh, who will do this. This is, I think, uh, not only business ethics, at the same time, government's rules, regulation, governance issue is important for this. And finally, uh, tax bed that I started with. The, are we paying our taxes, due taxes? Or is the tax regime not friendly for b doing business? I think this is a big question for both part of the uh, actors, public sector and private sector both. If we don't pay tax, then we cannot uh, uh, expect such level of high growth in the future, even if, because government cannot finance development for the uh, uh, higher growth of the country. So uh, with these things, um, I want to uh, stop. The main issue is the responsibility lies with the both sectors, but since Bangladesh, the business sector has been gaining momentum with the, some policy incentives of the government as well as other incentives. They have also, they have to learn how to do business in a responsible way, not at the cost of environment, not at the cost of health of the people. So some regulatory measures are also need to be in, enforced with some uh, uh, prudent policies that could help the businesses to grow at the same time to economy, the growth of the economy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzur Hussain. Uh, I have been vindicated in my uh, choice of you having <laughs> to speak last. You have raised a lot of very, uh, uh, you know, relevant points. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I guess, we have ten minutes that we can devote to question and answers from the floor. So, okay, uh, that gentleman, yes, in the back. Okay, all right, okay. Hello, sir. Um, Can I'm you Mr. Ridhar. Introduce yourself first, and then ask your question. Yeah. I'm Mr. Ridhar, a base student uh, from Dhaka University Economic Department. Okay. So I have a question for Dr. Asan. Asan, sir. Sir, I'm not. Um, Ita jani jab 
আমাদের যে গভর্নমেন্ট ওয়ার্কাররা আছে তারা আসলে এই সেক্টরে যে কন্ট্রিবিউট করে তারা ওইভাবে বেনিফিটটা পায় না তো আমরা যদি এইসব গভর্নমেন্ট ওয়ার্ক সরি গার্মেন্ট ওয়ার্কারদের জন্য যদি রেসিডেন্স ক্রিয়েট করতে পারি লাইক কোয়ার্টার কন্ট্রিবিউশন করবে গভর্নমেন্ট এবং প্রাইভেট সেক্টররা টেক্সটাইল মালিকরা তাহলে কি এটা আমাদের এই সেক্টর হাই গ্রোথের ক্ষেত্রে বড় ভূমিকা রাখতে পারে না থ্যাংক ইউ আরেকটা কোয়েশ্চেন হচ্ছে ফিল্টারিং সিস্টেম যদি আমরা চালু করি প্রত্যেকটা টেক্সটাইল ফ্যাক্টরির জন্য তাহলে কি আমাদের এনভায়রনমেন্টটা আরও ডেভেলপ হবে না থ্যাংক ইউ give some my opinion if i start with the uh, first of all i want to say i have started my business uh, in 1981 and at that time this scenario was different in 2006 17 uh, mr habibullah karim is presiding over the uh, this seminar it was unthinkable in 1981 so what the changes there well, I was younger than that one. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe your your father was not allowed to sit there <laughs> so the what is the problem actually uh, the, uh, let us let me reply to, uh, give some, some of my observations the problem here with this uh, this country here the the, uh, the slow investment the slow investment is slowing down what is the problem nobody raising the issue i have seen a study a global study that the entrepreneurship development in our country is alarmingly low it is a it is a main problem and uh, dr monsur also raised the issue that uh, of the sme and the gentleman uh, mr monwar Mo, uh, mr monjur hussain why this uh, sme is not growing here it's a major issue we are not giving we, the policy makers are not giving due attention to that actually there is no atmosphere for growing entrepreneur the entrepreneur start their business with sme then they grow 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 so uh, you'll see that uh, I, i i can foresee there will be a real problem very soon that there will be no new entrepreneur no new investment in new industries only the the existing industry will go there was a mismatch uh, there was a uh, present uh, uh, research from the cpd that uh, we, we can see that uh, the capital machine as import, import is growing but there is no new registration with investment board what is the wrong actually the hidden uh, problem was that there is no new entrepreneur the existing industry is growing that's why the capital machinery import is there that's high so it it creates a confusion among the policy makers now how to solve this problem yes i, I let me give it 10 minutes time because we so tabid is not there let me reply to uh, on behalf of the business community <laughs> okay okay so uh the problem with the the, the problem with the change uh, the uh, the rapid with the rapid where we are we are acquainted we are adopted ourselves with the rapid growth of this economy in this country i can humbly claim that the the reform is going on in business community they are competing with the foreign businessmen in the overseas market because our economy is now integrated with the global economy we are facing uh, challenge for the vietnam india china and others in global market but in other sector if you talk about the government or the bureaucracy they are not that much reformed they, they could not change themselves so that is another problem now we are you are talking about the etp affluent entrepreneur businessman is not interested to can you I, i have my own survey for last 50 years 70 years there are industry textile industry here but if you go there there is no space to set up one etp and and uh, again the investment I, i personally gone to that uh, uh, basic industry area in naranganj all the dyeing factory they are the dyeing factory situated in five katha jayga space okay, and it can, is not can, possible can you to have the next, next one minute okay okay okay, okay yes thank you so i say the, uh, from the from the very beginning our mindset was different we are not prepared for 6 or 7% growth so we shall have to change ourselves not only the business community whole nation thank you okay. 
Uh, my question to, uh, I'm Fazlullah from the National Youth and Social Council. My question to uh, for Dr. Farazi Bente Ferdal. You set up the example that is of India with the number of 50,000. Uh, as I was telling, we are doing the Smiling Sun Clinic, but beyond this, I found that the uh, people very much doing this, using the rural doctors and also the rural pharmacies. I surprised recently a nine days training course conducted the village girls, they paid 3,000, then invited us. And we conducted this nine days tra training, and I found in the village, they all are HSU, even the graduates. And with this limited money, even we give them these ladies, uh, waiting machine, pressure machine, and small checking uh, diabetic. I can tell you the youth we have, we have five million members. We are observing 50 years. We can do this in all six state villages. We have the capacity. But the question is this, we need support. Wisdom of elders and energy of youth should combine together. Banglakta kota se bapsai de. Je bonikra manobi kabe kabe. You have to do this. And at the same time, bhule ja benna, noi ma sai deshta sadhi noe che. Torundra bole, abhi de sar amra university chato bolchi. Amader kajal agal amra diyajar ekus sala Bangladesh ke level up kajal. Abi strongly believe kori. Dujay torun sab thik kajal. Thank you. Health service centers. Thank you. Very good. ये सेकंड रोते उन्हें आप उनका क्या हाथ तोड़े दिया ये चलाएंगे जो देखते हैं संख्या पे बोलें बिज़ वी नीड टू गिव द फ्लोर बैक टू द डिस्कशंस फॉर देम टू रिस्पॉन्ड टू योर क्वेश्चंस एंड देन रैप अप दिस सेशन इन द नेक्स्ट फाइव मिनट्स आई डोंट नो हाउ एम आई गो अमर ना मोहम्मद अब्दुल हाय, अमी चौलीर बच्चर आगे 73 ते सारे सात्रो चिला मार की, तो सार जमान यंग चिले ना कौन तो शेर को मियोंगी आचेन, उन्हें ना तो सुंदर बोक्ति ता है, अमुन कौन तो दीक्षा आजे ना भी सम्रित दो होइने, शॉप होये ची, तो वो प्रश्नों तो ठेके जाए, जब बालों शिक्षकों तो for higher inclusive growth, please. So, now, the economic zone is in the economic zone. So, how do you hear PPP? How do you hear PPP? How do you hear PPP? Now, the economic zone is in the economic zone. We have a question about the economic zone. We have a question about the investment significantly. The investment is really hot. The stagnation is really hot. The reason is that आर वजह ऐसा देख तो तो था जब बिसिकर तो जो पुराना मॉल है चोशु टीडा स्टेट चिलो तो शेह जगह गुली कर की क्यों बसता आज है बंग शेह जगह काजल लगे की एक्सपोज़ प्रोसिंग जून के अम्रा खाने ये कुछ शोमरित दो करते पाई ना की ना एक टा प्रश्न आर दूसरों तो होते सर आमादेर जो इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ 6.3 परसेंट � किंतु एकों ने जो प्रश्न होलो जे वो इकोनॉमिक्स जरूर बात है ये आधार थिंग्स रिमेनिंग द सेम जो दियो आशीषों ने आकाशीषों ने रामतेरी गंगा मेल हो है चीन दिया थे अमादेर एकों ने रामतेरी शॉप किचु मेल हो है गए थे अमादेर शॉप किचु एक और चीज नेगेटिव दिख एकों सार दितियो प्रश्न रसार if yes, then okay. If not, then what are the very critical issues or policies should be taken to address this issue for attaining sustainable development or social yes. inclusion? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I can only take one more question from this side because I have taken many questions from the other side. So one lady at the back there, yes. Thank you. I am Norush Jahan Dinar, Department of Economics, Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology. Okay. Sir, uh, Amar question is, Dr. Asan Monsur, Sarer Kase, Je Mane Amader economic growth, Sarer presentation, Sar de Giesen, Je Da Bache, Abong Bateyase, To Amrajani, Je Hoche corruption, corruption a Bangladesh Robustan, Mane CPI index, Exo Bialistomo. तो करप्शन ये तो बेशी थाकर कारण है ओ बांग्लादेशी रिंग गुरु एक ग्रोथ टा अशुले कांस्टेंट तो थाकते से ना अब आर कम तेज़ हो ना मैंने आम्र जानी करप्शन जो दी बेशी होए ताहोले एक उन्हें ग्रोथ कम बे तो बांग्लादेशी क्षेत्र क्या नो ये टा माने बात तेज़ है 
এটা একটা কোশ্চেন আরেকটা কোশ্চেন হচ্ছে মানে আর এম জি সেক্টরের যে যে মানে ইনসেন্টিভস দেওয়া হবে যে মানে যারা গার্মেন্টস ওয়ার্কার আছেন তাদেরকে যদি মানে হেলথ হেলথ সিকিউরিটি বা অন্যান্য যে ধরনের ইনসেন্টিভস যদি বাড়ানো হয় তাহলে কি মানে এটা যারা ইনভেস্ট করে বা হচ্ছে বাংলাদেশের জন্য কি এটা কতটুকু ভালো হবে বা মানে বাইরে থেকে যারা ইনভেস্ট করে বাংলাদেশে তারা কি ইনভেস্ট করবে পরবর্তীতেও না কি মানে অন্য কিছু আর কি So how can I say no to you? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Thank you very much. V very brief <clears throat> question, yes. Uh, the, <laughs> the first thing I'd like to mention refers to uh, a meeting that uh, at the MCCI in which uh, the governor of the Bangladesh Bank uh, gave us a talk. And one of the things he said was that nine companies in the country uh, are responsible for 40% of the non-performing loans in the country. My question is, would you rather that you give 9 million people's, uh, I mean 9 million people the, the loans, uh, which I think would average about 10 lakh takas per person, and uh, you know, would that be better than to give it to nine companies, uh, you know, I mean this, you know, 40%. The second uh, thing I'd like to uh, say is, uh, mm, uh, I mean, most of the speakers mentioned about education. Uh, most of the speakers mentioned about training, uh, you know, particularly in the industrial sector. Uh, our budget is 1.9% of GDP for education. I think that if we keep on at that low budget, can we have people to be trained? Because training is always at the secondary and the tertiary levels if you're talking about industrialization and input of labor into the higher technologies. That's my second question. The third would be uh, the same for the healthcare sector. I think somebody here has mentioned that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, if, I mean, we have people who can actually engage at the grassroots levels also for, for other activities than what we are, one, than what we have traditionally, we are traditionally seeing. I'm just wondering, uh, since the budget on the healthcare is also so very low, and since there have been reports that uh, pharmaceutical companies are manufacturing drugs that we don't need, very expensive, uh, unavailable to, you know, people at the lowest level. You know, I'm just wondering, it's a question, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, some, you know, some of you economists have, um, you know, may have thought about it. What about, um, I mean, you know, what about manufacturing essential drugs, uh, drugs that we need regularly? What if those could be purchased by the government at you know, at the lowest cost possible and at the, I mean, at the quality required. And then, uh, you know, Bangladesh has proved very well to be, uh, you know, to be, uh, uh, you know, they have the capability of, of last mile service, if you may. So, uh, you know, would that be a possibility so that we can also engage uh, SMEs, for instance, in a new type of work, you know, by which they could make an income? Uh, ICT, uh, I mean, in my travels, uh, and in meeting with people of you know various countries, we talk about Bangladesh being an ICT, uh, you know, I mean a prospect exists here for good ICT. And the one thing they tell me, at least more than one person has told me that, if we know what the capabilities of uh, what the current capabilities of your ICT sector is, we should then be able to consider at what level we will enter your country for ICT work. So I would, uh, you know, I mean, as a suggestion, I would say that if your association could have a piece of paper, you know, which was circulated to all our embassies in the world, for instance, or to, uh, I mean, associations, uh, you know, then they could know what we are capable of right now and where they could enter. So then you don't have to have uh, people, you know, give a job to somebody and then when he couldn't do it, he'd come and say, sorry, I can't do this. I think that's where a partnership could be available for us and a good, uh, uh, you know, a good, good prospect, uh, I mean, you know, exists there. The other point I'd like to make is, in India they say that you rather give money we to cannot, the... We cannot take much more questions. Because just one more. Dr. Dr. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm, I'm saying that in India they say that you rather give money to the temple than to tax because, uh, you know, the, I mean, the invisible can do for you what the visible cannot. And in the end, 
Water is life. I don't think we can do anything to compromise with water. I rest my case. So I will now come to uh, Dr. Hassan Mansoor, uh, the keynote speaker, to uh, respond to some of these questions as briefly as possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll go very, very briefly. Um, well, first is that quarters for, for workers. Look, Bangladesh has a serious problem. Serious problem in the sense that government has not paid any attention to low-income housing ever. Government has not allocated a single piece of land for low-income people in anywhere in Bangladesh. Uh, right now, they're talking about something to be given in Kerani Ganj. Why Kerani Ganj and not anywhere else, I don't know. Because why people will come from Kerani Ganj to Gulshan or to uh, other areas? How would they commute, uh, your driver or your maid or this? How would they do it? I mean, typically, low-cost housing should be around where the jobs are. For industrial workers, in the near around the industries, for household workers or service sector workers in the cities, right next to their workplaces. So it has to be scattered all across mm -hmm. the cities and country. Right? So it cannot be located in, a, in an untouchable area that where low-income people will be ghettoed and, and the rest of the people will be living in Gulshan, Baridhara, Bonani, and so on, which is for the upper class. So we have a very distinct class-based society. All our allocations are for the rich. All our land, which is the basis for formation of wealth in this country, is for the rich and bureaucrats and military and other influential people, not for the poor. That's a fact, and that's est well established. So that's about so far our constitutional rights for everybody to have housing. That's as far as our, 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 our support for socialism in the country. OK. Second point, ETP. The problem with ETP in Bangladesh is the problem of industrialization, scattered all across, cannot be monitored. Had, it, had those been in industrial clusters, had those been in that, we could have central ETP. It could have been monitored. Who is not processing it? Everybody could have been monitored in that way, and there had been accountability. So in future, we should focus our industrialization based on economic zones or clusters. And, and central ATPs should be the basis to go forward, not the individual ATPs, which is mostly, survey shows that they're mostly, even if they're made, they are shut down until the inspection day before. And they process some and show that this is the sample. So that doesn't work. Um, uh, yes. Now. Um, Investment cannot come, which that's an issue that has been dwelling with, and we all have various answers. Infrastructure is a problem. Legal issues is a problem in Bangladesh to solve a, uh, to get electricity it takes 404 days, which now the new Baida chairman and others are trying to bring it down to one month. So that will be an improvement if they can do it. Uh, issue is like legal settlement. It's a multi-year issue, your lifelong issue. You cannot see your own resolution of your court case during your lifetime. This is not way to do business. So these are the fundamental issues that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, private sector will be shying away, foreign investors will be shying away. And land is a perennial problem also. And, and title to land is never clear cut. And there are so many uh, mm, sh uh, Sharia based claims on the land that it's almost impossible to say this land is clean. You never know from where somebody else will show up and say, hey, I, I have this, uh, I'm a shurik. I'm a bhagat. And you are stuck. So that's the problem. Um, uh, is, uh, well, look, uh, rising income is not, I'm talking about you, is not, is, doesn't mean you're a developed country. Qatar is the highest per capita income in the world. Qatar is not considered a developed country. It's a rich country, but not a developed country. A development requires institutions, mm -hmm. balanced institutions, democratic institutions, legal institutions, law enforcement institutions, civil administration institutions, all those things has to go as per excellence to achieve development. Simply becoming rich cannot make the country developed. We must have take that to concept very differently. Uh, and, and, and I can tell you one thing, there is, no industri there is no industrial country which is characterized as industrial country without these basic institutions functioning very well, very efficiently. That's the way. The Korea that we see today, where they're impeaching their own, time, own, own president, president, whose father ruled like an emperor, is the change you can see that how the institutions can bring about changes. Where Samsung owner mm -hmm. in, uh, can go to jail for giving money to the government, mm -hmm. which every industrialist in Bangladesh is doing without impunity. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so th that's the difference why institutions matters, why governance is important. Now, um, corruption puzzle. Well, corruption puzzle is indeed a puzzle because uh, uh, the issue, the way, way I see it, is that how much could we have been growing had it not been that corrupt? Mm. So essentially, we are achieving 6% plus growth. Maybe we, should have, we could have achieved easily 8% plus growth already, and maybe we would have been looking at 10% plus growth by now had there been no corruption. Okay. And, and our cost of doing business in the sense that to make this for the bridge, we are doing it for $4.2 billion now. Maybe we could have done it at $2.2 .2 billion. Maybe made less. Who knows? So these are the cost of corruption. So our return on investment goes up because of corruption, be it private, be it public. Even for private, you are trying to do your best, but you have to spend money everywhere to expedite that process. And that's the cost of doing business. And rate of return has to be correspondingly higher to make it happen. So RMG and FDI, I can tell you one thing. There is no contradiction from national point of view. What we have seen, the BGMEA, is putting a restriction artificially on foreign investment in RMG in outside the export processing zones, right. and that is not, not in the national interest. It is, it is not in the national interest, it is in the interest of the BGMEA and their members, because they want to keep, one, wages low, they want to keep competition low, because, you see, foreign investments will, all, will increase employment, what is in our national interest is the employment, not to make few people richer, just because they have the Bangladeshi passport. Uh, well, that's up to them, but I have told the same story to them as well. <laughs> and now, um, consolidation of loan. This is a serious, serious governance problem, and this is a serious systemic risk to our banking system. I have told the governor the other day that if one person, I named it in front of him, if he dies tomorrow, your banking system is collapsed. Because that person has more than 40,000 crore loan. How do you pay? So this is, and he owns half of the banking system as well, or, or one third of the banking system as well. So how, how, do you, how do you solve this problem, this concentration problem? So this is a serious, serious systemic risk to our, and a change of government will make that happen the day after. So we have, to, we have to be very, very mindful about this high exposure to a few people, as he said, 9%, 40% loan. And, and, and of that, probably top two, one or two has a very undue proportion of, of, of that. And that's a serious systemic risk to our banking system. 1%, 9% loan education, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. No question. We're all striving for higher spending on education. But the finance ministers once put me this way. That look, I get only 10% from revenue, and I have all these obligations. How can I give on earth more than 2% for education? Tell me. And I couldn't have any answer. <laughs> you only have 10%. You have to pay salaries, wages, pensions, debt service, defense expenditure, and everything, and then pay for them. So it, 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 it. he said, give me 20% in revenue, I will pay 4% tomorrow. His answer is legitimate. So we have to pay for our education from the private sector to put as a revenue. But also, I must say one thing. Education cannot be achieved. Quality of education is not a function of money only. Amartya Sen wrote it long time ago, and he gave the example of Cuba, where a small fraction of money is spent on education, but quality is first rate. Both health and, 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 health and education does not depend on how much you spend. And Bangladesh is also a good example. Much of our money is wasted because teachers don't teach, they don't come, they don't, they don't have the proper training, all those things, but we are paying their salaries and doubling it up as well. Secondly, health workers don't show up in their work, but they get their salaries and so on. So we don't get our deserved share of uh, what we should be getting. So it is not directly related to that. The, that's it. There is a question on basic. You can answer. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan Mansoor and, and the audience. As is customary for the chairman to at least uh, attempt to do a summary, I will not try to uh, uh, address all points, but the points that has been directed uh, at, at the ICT sector, I, I, I think I must respond to those at least. So I'll go to the podium to respond to that. As a proper chairman. Uh, 
Our keynote speaker, Dr. Hassan Mansoor, distinguished panelists, uh, audience, uh, Dr. Selim Rahan, is he with us? Yes, oh, you were here. Okay, good. So first of all, thank you all very much uh, for uh, you know giving me this uh, uh, pleasurable duty to uh, perform as the chair of this session of very erudite people. Uh, many of the things that has been discussed in the keynote paper as well as the subsequent discussions. Uh, I know that personally because you know many of these things get discussed time and time again in the chambers and different uh, forums. Uh, but these are things that needs to be that need to be uh, said time and time again because there are many very 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 important things. One of the most important things that came out in all of the discussions today is socially and environmentally responsible business. And I'm very happy to share with you that MCCI in its vision has epitomized this thing. So we call ourselves the Chamber of Responsible Business. So that is at the heart of how we uh, do things or promote things uh, from MCCI. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, different issues that has been raised by the uh, discussants, Rubaiyat, uh, you know, uh, has raised a very important point that uh, you know we should not just impose things on on all the uh, ecosystem stakeholders or players, but we should do this on a cooperative basis. This was also raised by uh, Dr. Ferdos. Uh, but through negotiation, through participation, we should, uh, you know, try to accommodate everybody. And I think that is very, very important. And in fact, uh, the trend has been, you know, I, I know my good friend, Dr. Siddiqui, what he indicated that, you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't have been chairing a session like this, because in those days, everything was monopolized by the state, by the government function functionaries. But today, it's very different. 80% of the economy is in the private sector. And in fact, only for that reason, uh, Asan Bhai, I mean, I would be the devil's advocate to say that maybe we should keep our tax to GDP ratio to 10%. Keep the money in the private sector. Don't give any more money to the government because, you know, more money you give it to them, the, the, you know, there is a tendency to waste that money. So why should we encourage that? Rather, we should try to contain corruption. And I fully agree with you, if we contain corruption, just by containing corruption without increasing investments, there are many studies on this. I'm sure Asan Bhai knows this. Every, many of you know this. We can increase our GDP growth rate by 2%. 2% without additional investment, just by containing corruption. What a Aladdin's magic lamp we have in our hands. We are not taking advantage of that. So that is something we should, we should try to do. And in terms of the, uh, 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 the ICT sector, the points raised, one was a uh, direct, uh, you know, uh, allegation <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I, I said sector, there is lack of professionalism. Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, in defense of my colleagues in the ICT sector, I must say that all sectors in Bangladesh suffer from lack of professionalism, whether you're an economist, whether you're a doctor, whether you're an engineer, you know, that is something that is a common malaise across all professional groups in Bangladesh. So we definitely need to improve that. I, I don't deny that. Uh, including uh, the ICT sector. Uh, but having said that, it is also true that uh, when it comes to giving work to ICT uh, companies, you know, the government and even private sector companies, they always, you know, think that anybody uh, who has one programmer is an ICT company. Anybody who has two programmers is a software company. That is very wrong. I mean, you, even for artwork, you have different grades of contractors. You know, you cannot give, a, give the contract for a 100-story building to a contractor who just started construction uh, just uh, six months back. So similarly, in ICT, you also need to understand the maturity process of that company. So this, there's a serious lack of understanding on the understanding of the uh, you know, process maturity within software companies, within ICT service companies. The, so th th there needs to be some as Asan Bhai again has said, the institutional development in that area. So what are those institutional uh, uh, mechanisms? One is for software companies to have international certifications like ISO 9000 or CMMI. That's one. On the buyer side, government agencies, private companies, they need to have institutional mechanisms for their software services called ITIL. I know, it's probably just news to you. But that's how you bring systemic knowledge within your organization for you to be able to 
get what you want from uh, software service providers or IT service providers. In terms of what is possible in Bangladesh, there are plenty of white papers that Basis has put out. There are plenty of articles that I have personally put out in Daily Star, Financial Express, even you know, many of my articles have been published in Forbes and other international uh, uh, journals. So where we have <coughs> said what we can do, the tragedy is we export our software and IT services to 70 countries of the world, but we fail to get all the large contracts within the country. So when it comes to large contracts within the country, we get the same complaint that you're not professional enough, you cannot deliver. And I had you know, debates on this, uh, including with the chief advisor, Dr. Fakhruddin Ahmed, and many others. <laughs> so, and you, all the foreign mini uh, yeah, finance ministers that, that you can name in the last 20 years. But the bottom line is, professionalism is not something that you can just do an average of the whole industry and say that you lack professionalism. You have to look for the you know, small islands of professionalism that exist in all professions. So you have to find that in the ICT sector as well. So I, I will not uh, uh, you know, go any further than that, but on the area of responsible business through socially and environmentally uh, sustainable uh, business, I'll just leave one additional thought with you, and this is something very new. You know, in 2007 and 8, when the US economy collapsed because of the subprime mortgage uh, debacle, Rockefeller Foundation came up with this new slogan, a responsible business, through what they call impact investment. So impact investment, that concept is not very new. Concept is an old thing, it's an old wine in a new bottle, but they very professionally uh, packaged it and uh, promoted it. This is basically the concept of uh, you know, the triple uh, uh, bottom line. Profit, people, planet. So any business, of course, it must make a profit to survive, but it must also have some social benefits, which is people. It must also have uh, environmental benefits, which is for the whole planet. So, so this socially and environmentally responsible investments is called impact investments. And impact investing is a very new trend. This is slightly different from the social business that Professor Yunus promotes, which is basically not for profit uh, and uh, you know, NGO based, but this is pure business. This is pure business with those additional two bottom lines in addition to profit. And I'm uh, very happy to share with you that in Bangladesh, we are trying to make ground uh, in that area. Uh, the, the, the global flag bearer in impact investing is an organization called Impact Investment Exchange out of Singapore, which was set up under Rockefeller Grant, by the way, Rockefeller Foundation Grant. I'm an advisor on their global advisory board, and we are also setting up a, a, a branch in Bangladesh. In addition to that, you know, Mr. Aras Khan, the former uh, planning commission member who is currently the chairman of Islami Bank, they have taken an initiative also to do impact investments in Bangladesh through another very large local corporate. So this is the thing that, you know, uh, we need to focus, whenever we focus on business, we have to focus on all these three things. No, let's, let us not just talk about profit alone. And there has to be better enforcement of rules and regulations. All the good, good rules and regulations are there, but enforcement is not there. So we have to help the government make better enforcement. So thank you all very much uh, for uh, staying with us uh, this afternoon after a heavy lunch, which I missed. But, <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, uh, we welcome you all uh, to uh, some tea and coffee, I suppose. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for a very lively discussion. We'll now have the crest presenting ceremony. I'd like to request our Honorable Chair, Mr. Habibullah N. Karim, to kindly present crests to our distinguished panelists. Uh, we can start with Mr. Rubayat Zamil. To Dr. Muhammad Abu Yusuf. To Dr. Monzur Hussain.
to Mr. Khandakar Mainuddin. To Dr. Farazi Binti Firdos. I would now like to request Dr. Selim Rahan to kindly present crests to our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Asan Mansur. And now I would like to request Dr. Selim Rahan to present crest to Mr. Habibullah and Karim. Thank you, everyone. That was the end of this session.